everybody can appreciate <laughs> what is happening here. So I'm an add on. <laughs> so what happened was, um, so Nikon was down doing um, some PD in my school board. And then, but he had to, he's flying out tonight, but he had to do this webinar. So I was like, well, okay, I'm heading over to um, the hotel that I'm staying at. So you could run the webinar from there. But then we realized, so his, he thought his was like from six to seven. And then this was like seven to eight 30. So I was like, oh, great. You could like pop in at seven. <laughs> Cause I was telling him what we're doing. So he was all excited about that. And then he realized, oh no, his is like 6.30 to 7.30. So I'm like, oh, well, we can't be in the same room, like doing <clears the throat> webinars if he's doing one and we're doing one. So um, so I start to, you know, call people I know that's staying at, coming to stay at this conference. And I got a hold of Roberta. I'm like, Roberta, are you in a room? <laughs> can you, uh, can you go and come to your room and run a webinar? Can you come over here and we're running in this one? So <laughs> isn't that just something? So that is, um, that's our story tonight. It's how we roll at the leaves. Yeah. You made, you made it work. It's all that matters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, here we are. All right. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen for a minute. Okay, where are we here? I have multiple screens going on. So um, hello everyone. Welcome to uh, our um, third series for in this, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm multitasking. So this, <laughs> this is why I'm getting distracted here. Welcome to our, our part three of our webinar series with uh, Wab Gizek Rice, who's um, going to be hosting this. And tonight we are joined with us, uh, special guest, Isaac Murdoch. Um, and uh, just before we get started, just a couple of house informational pieces. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by the First Nations Métis Inuit Education Association of Ontario. So I didn't even introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jody Williams, and I'm one of the co-chairs for this organization. And uh, I'm joined with me with my friend and colleague from uh, another school board. So I, I work as the Indigenous Education Coordinator for Dufferin Peel Catholic District School Board. And I'm with here with my friend. Say hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? Hi, I'm Roberta LaPlante and uh, I'm at Algonquin Lakeshore Catholic District School Board. Um, so I'm happy to just sit here with Jody and listen to the webinar from here. Because I usually listen to it from my house. <laughs> so we get to be here together. And, you know, and Roberta has taught the MBE course for many, many years. So mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. we may have you add in a few tidbits at the end when we get to the Q&A. Um, but anyway, our organization is guided by an Elders Advisory Council. So all of our resources um, and the work that we do to support Indigenous education across the um, province is guided through this elders council, many whom are residential school survivors, many who are, are also uh, fluent language speakers. And so it really, uh, just to bring that forward, to speak to the legitimacy of the work that we are doing and um, resources that we put out on our website. At the end of our session, we have a giveaway. Woohoo! So um, I will be posting in the chat box um the link to put your name in for a draw we are going to be giving away we have Isaac I'm sure we'll talk about his two books that he now has out um as well as uh Wob's book Moon of the Crested Snow so we will be giving away um those books for people for those of you who are joining in on the YouTube side of this webinar uh you'll notice in the description box below if you you may have to click on the show more button um but on that um you can uh find the link uh to join or to um put your name in for the draw as well on the youtube side so i will be putting in that link um as we uh go through tonight's webinar so watch for that in the chat box um and uh, i'll come back to this at the end 
afterwards we'll we'll talk about what's coming up next so i'm now going to uh turn it over to wob and uh and isaac and they're going to chat for a little while and then i will throw in a link as well into the chat box for you to ask your questions um, and then we will moderate those questions for you as well and again for those who are joining in over on the youtube side there is the link there for you in the description box to also put your questions forward to Wob and Isaac tonight. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Wob. Okay, chmigwech, Jody. Bonjour, menonakshik. Wob gijik indijnikas, makwan no dem. Wasak sing don jba. Nishnabe minwa jagnashinda. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Wob Gijik Rice. Uh, you may call me Wob for short. I'm a member of the Bear Clan of the Nishnabek of Wasaksing First Nation. That's an island community on Georgian Bay near Parry Sound, Ontario. Uh, I am of Nishnabe and Canadian descent. My dad is from the Res and my mom is from town. And I currently live in Sudbury, Ontario, which is also known as Swakamuk. It's the traditional territory of Atikamekshing and Nishnabek. And where I live now and where I'm originally from are lands that are part of the Robinson Huron Treaty that was signed back in 1850. And I reside here in Sudbury with my wife and two sons. And uh, just very pleased, very honored to be with you all tonight. Chimigwech to Jody and everybody at FNMIEAO for inviting me to uh, to host this webinar series. This is our third one, and it's been a lot of fun so far. If you've been a part of the first two, I hope you took a lot away from those. And I'm sure you're going to have a great time tonight with uh, the brilliant and uh, talented and resourceful storyteller that we have uh, with us here. So without further ado, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Bob Magizic, also known as Isaac Murdoch. He is from Serpent River First Nation and is from the Fish Clan. Uh, he spent years living in the bush as a trapper, a wild rice harvester, a maple syrup maker, and a hunter. He is a student of the pictographs of his people, of the Nishabek, and he is a student of the stars as well. Isaac is well respected as a storyteller and traditional knowledge holder. For many years, he has led various workshops and cultural camps that focuses on the transfer of knowledge to the youth. And he has committed his life to the preservation of Nishinaabe cultural practices and spent years learning directly from the elders. Isaac currently lives at Nimki Ajbekong. Uh, Isaac, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Hello, how are you? I'm doing I'm well. Good. How is uh, how are things where you are? Oh, things are doing really good. Things are really well. I got some time off, so it's nice to be able to relax at home, be in my own bed. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah, you're on the road a lot, eh? I am. Yeah, yeah. I travel quite a bit. Right on. Well, we're we're really uh, really excited that you're with us tonight. I'm sure the educators gathered here are, are pretty keen to hear uh, what you have to share. You know, we're going to talk about your books uh, uh, in a, in a little bit. But uh, to begin, can you just you know give the uh, the crowd gathered an idea of you know your beginnings of your upbringing? You know how you came to uh, connect with the Nishnabe knowledge and stories and so on. Yeah, that's. Uh... I mean, I, I grew up in an Indian home, and I remember, uh, you know, being in the bush, you know, eating berries and living like that, eating a lot of moose meat. My earliest memory is seeing a big pile of moose meat in our living room. It was like a mountain, and I remember climbing on it. I must have been just a toddler, like a little baby, climbing on that big mountain of moose meat. Um yeah, so it's that was that was my uh, my upbringing like that. Um, when I was five years old, me and my brothers were taken away by Indian agents. Um, we were returned back to our parents, uh, to my mother, and uh, uh, I got sent to go live with elders um, when I was young because uh, my mother probably knew that school wasn't for me that there was another type of learning that needed to happen. And so I was sent into the bush to go learn. It was a good, it was a good life. And uh, I really got to take a deep dive into pictography. Hmm. And, and it was through the, that study that I was able to learn about the different types of symbols that our people were using. So with the Anishinaabek people, we actually had three symbolic 
systems to convey information. And so I started to dive in and study all three of them, which was really, really fascinating for me as a young person. And so that learning took me, you know, all over the place, uh, you know, studying pictography. And uh, the, the three main, I guess, ways that we communicate through symbolism, one is through uh, pictographs. And those are the, the ones that you find on with the red paint on the rocks. Mm -hmm. And so that's one form of writing. Then the other form of writing that I studied was the writing that was used more commonly that you might find on birch bark scrolls or on birch barks or mapping or, you know, just messages to give to one another. That was almost a, a completely set of, of writing that uh, just completely fascinating. And the third symbolic form of, of communication that was through symbols was sign language. And so that was my upbringing was trying to understand and learn as much as I could about those. And so it was a very fascinating, I had a very fascinating uh, youth, that's for sure. Yeah, no doubt. Sounds like, sounds like a pretty immersive and uh, really tangible hands-on way to, to learn about culture and stories then, eh? Yeah, back in those days, they didn't have programs and services like we do now. You know, everything's run through a program or a service, right? But back in those days, it was like, nope. You know, you walked. I had to walk where I had to go. <laughs> you know, so I'd walk down the road and I'd hitchhike. And uh, maybe I'd go to a band office and get a welfare check just to get me to the next site, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I want to thank all of the clerks that helped me along the way. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I'd have a check within two hours. <laughs> it's, different to, it's different today, though, I imagine. But back then, you could walk in there and get a check within two hours. And I'd be honest with them. I'd say, I'm going to go. I need to go study these pictographs. I need to go over there. But I don't have any money. And they did cut me a check. Hmm. Yeah, $214 at the time. That was the most that they could give, but it was enough. Yeah. yeah. Great on. Yeah. So, and that like just speaks to the, um, I guess, the, the community intent and the community spirit, uh, you know, to support people in, in, in that knowledge at, at the same time. So when, when you were growing up and you were learning about, you know, the stories through the pictographs and, you know, through the birch bark scrolls and, and even in the signs, um, what were some of the stories, the Anishinaabe stories that really, uh, really compelled you to learn more or, or really stick with you uh, up until today? I think a lot of the, the creation story was marked down on on pictographs, certain locations, um, especially where Nanabuju was. There was often a lot of pictography where Nanabuju was, and so people were describing, you know, what what he did, you know, who he who he was fighting, who he killed, who was trying to kill him, uh, you know, his battles, those types of things, and so it, it became like a, you know, like when you're watching a friggin' uh, uh, TV, television show mm -hmm. like for example lately i've been watching cobra kai right <laughs> nice. so you watch you watch season one right yeah and then it's like you can't stop watching it so you got to go to season two and then yeah. season three season you know it keeps on going and you just you just like you just get right into it and you can't stop watching it well that's how it is with with the our creation story when i was younger um it was like the more that i learned and the more pieces that got put in there it was like I was literally watching this huge, big, long, incredible uh, history lesson of our people and our, and our creation story. And so it became uh, addictive. Mm -hmm. It's like that's all I ever wanted to do was learn more and more and more because there was, I, was too, I was too involved. I was too invested. I just mm -hmm. couldn't jump, jump out of it. Yeah. You know, so going to, going to school was not an option. <laughs> like there was no way I could go to school at that point. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Why would you? <laughs> well, yeah. then, when um, you know, I I, I grew up with it with a bit of uh, creation stories too. You know, and not nearly to the extent of you, but you know, when I was younger, what I always really appreciated about it was, you know, there's not just one creation story. Uh, you know, there there are different sort of um beginnings and different endings, different messages, and even in between, in the middle there are different sort of uh, 
uh, like addendums, like different inroads into other parts of the creation story too. So, and, and it was my understanding for my youth too, is that like each storyteller had their own gift to give to the story itself. And then that would sort of, you know, propagate or, or evolve through time and from community to community. And, and do you think that's part of the, um, the, you know, the beauty of holistic Nishinaabe storytelling? Is that something that you really uh, attach to as well? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's always, um, you know, like for our own creation story, because I've heard it so many times as a young person, um, you know, you heard different versions or you heard pieces that you never heard before, you know, and these little pieces often branch off into other stories. And so it's almost like a tree. You have the roots, which is the the creation story, and then it kind of, they all root up and be, they become a solid uh, stump, you know, and it becomes strong. And then, of course, it branches off into all these amazing, beautiful stories. And so, but I also believe how accurate these stories are, mm -hmm. because when I was in northern Saskatchewan, and I was researching uh, the pic the pictographs on the Churchill River, I think I was at pictograph number 14 or 15 at uh, near Nostoyak Falls. And I remember hearing a story about this picture of a man, a wolf, and a moose. And they told the most beautiful creation story about fire. And it was estimated that that pictograph was probably about 2,000 years old. Hmm. And when I went to the Great Lakes about 20 years later, I went to another pictograph site, which was about seven, maybe 8,000 years old. It was a picture of a man, a moose, and a wolf. And it was the creation story of fire. Hmm. And they were both identical stories. Wow. And it just goes to show you that, you know, through thousands of years of history of time, thousands of miles apart, they were able to keep this story intact, almost virtually the same. Hmm. And so I think that oral oral uh, history is probably the most accurately um, passing down type of information that you can have, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to books or the Google or the internet, they just don't have the, the historical accuracy, um, I think, as as oral history it's really accurate history and that's what i always found fascinating is i'd be hearing the same stories all over the place like in some of these places are hundreds or thousands of miles apart mm -hmm. and yet the pictography was the same the stories were the same and yet and it's it, it's just fascinating how how powerful oral history really is mm -hmm. I think that speaks to the power of memory, too. And th there was an elder from my community from Wasoxing, uh, Fred Wheatley. And I remember when we were little kids, he used to always tell us, you know, like, when we tell you a story, you remember that and you tell everybody else around you. And the more you tell other people, the more you're going to remember it. And, you know, that sort of uh, taught me about that repetition over the years, right, of, of making sure those stories were passed down. And in some ways, like, uh, you know, exactly what you're saying, that makes them more precise in some ways, I, I believe. Do, do you think so, too? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, telling those stories and, and memorizing them and making sure that the listener is listening and, not, and, and pays attention is important. So I used to watch the old storytellers, and they used to call them the uh, Akwanini is what they used to call them. And I heard a story one time, and I'll tell you about this story. There was a, a, a person that came through our territory a long time ago, and uh, we used to have a village near a place called Ginebegokshibigajwat. And of course, the storyteller came in, and very, very, very spiritual people they were at that time. And he went and sat in this lodge, and, they, you know, it was beautiful. Um, probably like the lodge I'm, that I'm sitting in right now. <laughs> and uh, the storyteller began to tell his story. And there was a young person in there that challenged him. Hmm. Now, under Anishinaabek law, 
that storyteller had the right to kill that boy. Hmm. Had to, he could kill that young man for disrespecting him in that lodge. So he often went with the club. And so it was a very serious thing. Like you had to listen, yeah. you know, but storytellers are funny. They make you laugh, you know, all that stuff. But I remember them telling me that and that this storyteller had that club and, you know, had the right to kill that young man for challenging him or making fun of him when he was telling the story. Mm. And so I always, when I heard stories, I sat there, I listened, I never made eye contact with the storyteller. You know, I laughed like, like hell sometimes because the <laughs> stories were funny. Um, but I never disrespected. I never made a noise. Those were the, like the, the laws of being there, I guess. Yeah. You couldn't, in, you could not interrupt. Those were, that was important. Yeah. Yeah, always, always listen, never interrupt. That's uh, those are the lessons from my youth too. <laughs> you, know, you just don't do that, right? <laughs> no, no. So when, but yeah, so you, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, but yeah, it was. Uh, there was a couple of stories like that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a couple of stories where, where the storyteller would come in and they'd bring in gifts and stuff like that, and, um, but you know. Sometimes, especially when during times of famine and war and sickness, the storyteller had a very big role to play because the storyteller would often give the people hope and, you know, remedies and, you know, places because the storyteller had all this knowledge about all these places. So they'd, he would help the people during those times. And often that's when they would travel. Mm -hmm. The, uh, um, it wasn't always in the winter either. It was, if there is a bad situation, the storyteller, of course, would go. Hmm. Yeah. So your, your upbringing, you know, uh, very much an education in the bush from your elders, right? And, and you know, being rooted in, in the Schnabe ways of thinking and stories and so on. Um, but in the same time, Parallel to that, like out in the mainstream system, um, you know, Nishnabi experiences or stories weren't necessarily valued, right? Uh, and there was a long time when, you know, our people's uh, cultural knowledge was was forbidden and outlawed and so on. So when you think about, you know, what was going on back then and you compare it to now, having opportunities like this to share stories with educators and to know that, you know, uh, children and youth in, in the mainstream system are learning more about our truths and our experiences and so on. Uh, how do you feel about that? What do you think about how the progress that's been made in the mainstream? I think it's important because when I was young, these stories were, they were viewed as foolish. Mm -hmm. You know, they weren't viewed as credible stories. And I always say that they're, this is our history as opposed to even stories. I'm, 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 I'm a history teacher, right? I teach the history of things that happened. And so that's why Keganon's Press, you know, when, when I was speaking with them, I said, let's, let's make this a history series as opposed to a storytelling series. Mm -hmm. I said, because these are actual real things that happened. And I think that, you know, back then, of course, they didn't, they thought that was all rubbish. But now people are starting to listen simply because a lot of these stories contain the natural law, the Chinook Nagewin in on in on how to live here, the sacred laws on how to live here. And so these stories can bring awareness to people on how to live here properly mm -hmm. because a lot of the stories have uh, coded information in them on how to live here correctly. And so I think that there's more of a reception today, but I also think that it was because people pushed and pushed and pushed, you know, mm -hmm. I don't think that if people didn't push so hard, we wouldn't be having this webinar today. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so a lot of people worked hard to make this happen to where we are, you know? Yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. Yeah. And we're thankful for that for sure. 
Uh, you, you touched on this really briefly. You know, you know, you said you went to Kegedons and you wanted to create uh, some history resources. Uh, but can you can you tell us a bit more about what inspired you to write and publish uh, the Trail of Danabojo? The elders, the elders says you have to write the stories down. You have to get them down in the books mm -hmm. because we're losing everything so fast that if you don't write them down, things can be lost. And it's, she, they said it's the little things that mean so much. And so I, I never would have written anything down ever. Mm. You know, like I was against all that even in the beginning. Mm. You know, I was always told, don't write anything down. It has to be done person to person, you know, all that stuff. And, uh, you know, we were raised never to write things down, mm. you know, and to, to use our heads and listen. Um, but as time, things moved too fast. Colonization happened too fast. Mm -hmm. And people weren't on the land anymore. You know, everybody was either working in three economies, either programs and services economy, the political economy, or the education economy, mm -hmm. you know? And so no, and that takes everybody away from the land. Mm -hmm. And so once that happened, and once people started to go into the schools all the time more and more and more then it then it left a void i think mm -hmm. and people the story started to disappear mm -hmm. because people were going to they weren't in the bush learning on the land learning the stories of the land they were in uh, universities learning another way mm -hmm. and it wasn't their fault because that's um you can't you can't fault anybody because everybody's been impacted by colonization mm -hmm. But, you know, the Indian Act, that's what it was designed to do, was to completely absorb us into the Canadian uh, society, into the Canadian politic, into Canadian education. And so it was on purpose to remove people from the land and from their stories. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what it did. Yeah. And so, um, but I, but Keegan's press, you know, they're really awesome because they did all the Basil Johnson books and like, Mm -hmm. Like they just have such a great legacy of, of trying to capture Anishinaabe and, mm -hmm. and the stories and all of that. And so when the elder says, you got to write the, you got to make the books, you got to do the books. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, I think it was Christy Belcourt who got a hold of Kaganon's press and they agreed to, uh, to take this on. So we have, uh, there's a, uh, it's going to be six, a six book history Oh, wow. And it's it's nonfiction is what it's titled under mm -hmm. six six book history um, series. So I'm pretty yeah. stoked. I mean, <laughs> I mean, a lot of people will say, you know, that stuff shouldn't be written down. And you know what? I agree with them. There's a part of me that does agree with them. You know, there's always that conflict. Yeah. But but our people have been writing stuff down for thousands of years. Mm hmm. You know, and some, you know, one of these days, some snot-nosed little kid, you know, is going to find that book a hundred years from now. And they're going to be like, holy crap, check this out. You know, the same <laughs> way that we do when we find a hundred-year-old book or when we find an old map or when yeah. we find old documents, it's like, oh my goodness, check this out. So, I mean, that's really what inspired me to do it was that, you know, the future generations being able to have these stories yeah and and i totally agree i totally agree with you on on the importance the need to write it down and you know really want to highlight what you said about how swiftly uh we've been removed how swiftly things have been removed from us you know and if you look at anybody's like family lineage it's really like just a couple generations since you know some of us were were in the bush speaking our languages fluently and now you know like my my generation younger not necessarily uh living that way right like my my grandma's generation they spoke the language fluently uh, my dad's generation sort of a mix but then mine mostly English, right? So that's pretty quick. You know, that's only three generations, as you're saying. So that's sort yeah, of, I think, I think that highlights the importance to get these things down for sure. Absolutely. We're only a couple of generations from a dog sled. Yeah. You know, and so it just, uh, it happens so fast. 
And but we also have to acknowledge that it happened on purpose. This is what the government wanted. <clears throat> yeah. You know, so once the fur, uh, the fur, the trapping stopped, you know, then everything kind of went sideways after that. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, again, Indian Affairs had a big part in it too. Yeah. So there was there was this big promotion that, you know, uh, and I mean, I guess for. I can't, I can't say it's wrong, but they always used to say that, uh, I remember when that first came out, that uh, education is the new buffalo, you know? And that happened about the same time that uh, people couldn't make a living on the land anymore. Things were changing. And so yeah. people were told to go to school because how are they going to survive? It, it, this was poverty politics by the government that was happening. Yeah. And so, you know, people had no choice. They had to live. They had to eat. Mm -hmm. And they got, they got tunneled into this programs and services economy, which unfortunately takes years of education to get, to get into. Mm -hmm. And all of it removes people from the land. Mm -hmm. And so this was a strategic move by the government to ensure that this took place, and they view it as, as progress. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, this so-called progress also leaves huge gaps, generational gaps with language, cultural knowledge, land-based education. You know, Anishinaabe Odswin, mm -hmm. you know, our discipline of education was a really super high education because our people, of course, lived on the land without a garbage can. Mm -hmm. Western education has not been able to produce a society that can live without a garbage can. Mm -hmm. You know, so it just goes to show that that going back to our own education systems is, is really critical for our survival and that we have to balance things. We can't always just go one way. Mm -hmm. We have to always, our way, our Anishinaabe way is, uh, is critical for our survival. It's because mm -hmm. it teaches us how to live here and continue living here. So mm -hmm. we, can't, we can't give up on that. We have to push back on the government even if it means we go poorer and we have to return back to the land in some way, somehow, mm -hmm. so we can keep that education, keep the stories, keep the language, keep the, the history of the land alive, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and, and it's, it's difficult because we got pushed too far, yeah. you know, we got pushed way too far on purpose and it's hard to go back. It's hard to, uh, to 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 make those those steps back to try to reclaim and rekindle what we've lost or what what's still you know what's forgotten. You know, and and it's so but important. We're doing, but we're doing it. We're doing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and it's so true. Like so many people were faced with a decision of survival based on economic you know reliance and and generating self-worth that way right and that that's that couldn't be more opposite to the Anishinaabe way of being right right so I mean I mean people like that cannot be criticized or made feel less than because hmm. that's this was all uh a big part of uh the movement to get people off the land so that resource extraction can take place and so the government was just pouring lots of money into education, education, education. And, you know, because they needed to remove indigenous people from the land mm -hmm. for, for mining and logging and all of that stuff. So, yeah. you know, it's nobody's fault. It's just the way no. that it went down. Yeah, I know. And, and like, I don't blame anybody for myself not knowing my language fluently or for not having a lot of that connection still. You know, that's just just the way it went, right? Um, get, getting back to the book, though, The Trail of Nanabojo, you know, it's, it's really like heartwarming to think of fu future generations picking it up, you know, like I, I think of my kids in particular who are able to pick up the book here in our home, right? Uh, and, and it's cool to know that also it's going to be a six part series. I didn't I didn't realize that. So why did you want to start with the Nanabojo stories? You know, some of those creation stories um, that explain the world around us. Uh, why was that the starting point for you in, in terms of the series? I think because it's like, you know, it's part of it's it's the beginning, you know, mm -hmm. it's the beginning. And so I thought that would be a good place to start, you know, the creation of the world and all of that. So I thought that would be 
the place to start, you know, naturally. Um, and, but that's, that really, that in itself could be 10 books or more, yeah. you know, like it's not, I, you couldn't, you couldn't put everything in there because it's too, it's too elaborate. It's too long, you know? So we just had to do what we could do, you know? Um, but it just seemed like that was the place to start. And then of course, serpents, and then there'll be one on Thunderbirds and little people, you know, there'll be one on, on, uh, the stars and, you know, different things like that. And so yeah. it's, it's going to be, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. All the materials there. Like I'm, I've got the material already. Mm -hmm. Well, there, so there's, it's, it's, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. It's exciting. Yeah, and what I loved about the Trail of Nanabojo is just, like, the familiarity there, you know? Like, I, I remember a lot of those stories from my own childhood, you know? And it just, it brought me back to that point. And, and just knowing that people can can share in that and can read about that is really awesome. So, so with Serpents, uh, that's the new book that just came out. Uh, can you tell us a little more about what's in it? Yeah, that book is called Serpent serpents and other uh, spiritual beings. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I thought it was cool because... We have so many stories about serpents. And, you know, when I was doing my education growing up, we had to learn about where the serpent holes were hmm. and the tunnels and where the tunnels went to. And so that for me, that was quite fascinating. So, you know, there'd be a place called in Sagamagaming, you know, where a serpent hole was and where this great serpent, this white serpent, the boss of all the other serpents in the area lived. There was a tunnel that went down to Mojgudmergaming, you know. Then it went down to a place called, uh, no, it went to Akakwe uh, Gwinda. And then it went to Mojnagaming. And then from there it went to Kipkop Kikmixing. And then from there it kept traveling to a place called Gindmigasin. Uh, and then from there, going to be Gokshibigajwat. Then to Ginebek Neashing. Then to Shkodiing. Then it would go to a place called Ginebek Gokshibigajwat. You know, then to Bodashkaying. Asini Swasaning. Minwa Mitigogzibing. And then it would go over to Kwigwegzwang. Nadwe Gajing. Abdash Kissening. These are all places where the serpent tunnel would come up. And you know, the serpents were often seen there. But right at those locations, people were fasting there because they knew the serpent had a den there. And so people were fasting there trying to get information from them. And of course, that's where you'd find the pictographs. Mm -hmm. And so based on knowing where the tunnel system was, that's where I could find the pictographs when I was doing my research. And... You know, I felt that it was important to really talk about the serpent's power and how it's not to be disturbed. And that during the time of the, the great agreements, you know, they always say that nobody was to dig deeper than a hand. That's hmm. because they believe that the serpents are under there. Their eggs are under there. Their power is under there. And if we disrupt that power, we could destroy the earth. Hmm. And so during the treaties, they didn't want them to be digging in the ground because if they took that power up, they could destroy the whole everything. Hmm. And so I felt this book was important because it talks a lot about the natural laws that we're not supposed to bother things mm -hmm. and that we're supposed to give our offerings. And so that's what the book is really about. Hmm. It's just like story after story after story of you know, different places. There's really cool characters and medicine people and, okay. you know, all sorts of, of twists and turns. But it's really about a book about offerings and, and not disturbing the, the ground. Hmm. So, and I felt, yeah, I felt that was a, a very important message, especially now. Oh, absolutely. You know, <laughs> uh, more, more important than ever, for sure. And in, 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 in Serpents and in the Trail Nanabojo, and I'm sure with the rest, uh, they're bilingual. They're both uh, Jagnashmoen, English, and, and Nishnabemwen. Why did you want to do it that way? Well, I felt it was important to have both so that 
um, they can be used as a resource for language. So if somebody's learning the language, they can actually read one they can cross reference back and forth. So the way that they're set up is like this, you know, one in uh, Anishinaabemowin, one in English, all the way down like this throughout the whole book. So each paragraph is right beside each other, you know, so you can see it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's better that way so that the learner is able to, I mean, of course the language holds so much more uh, information than English. But it's good for people that are learning because it, the more the more that we can get our language down, the better it is, you know. Yeah. So I I will not uh, participate in resource development if it doesn't include our language, mm. because we're at a critical point. It doesn't make sense, you know. So like as a dad, as a grandpa, you know, I have I'm a, I have seven grandchildren. I have a responsibility to try and do as much language and bring as much language to the world as possible. Yeah. You know, so it just doesn't make ethical sense to do anything else. If I, if I do something, it's going to be in the language too. Right on. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Great way to be. Sp speaking of learners, uh, our, our, our audience here tonight, everybody gathered here online is, is, is in education. Uh, our educators or our administrators and so on. So when you're um, meeting with people in the education system or or when, you know, you get approached to share knowledge or when people tell you that, you know, they want to share your books in their classroom and so on, uh, what do you want educators to know about that, about that process in terms of uh, relaying the knowledge that you're uh, giving to the world uh, onto students, onto young people? Well, I really want them, like, I think that the stories are, I mean, it's not entertainment. This is our history. <clears throat> and so I think that, you know, getting to know each other is important, but also understanding how sacred the land is, is the message I think that I'm trying to convey to, to anybody who reads the book. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so good for teachers to read this to their kids. I mean, some of the stories are, are not appropriate for kids. You know, but some of them are. And so when you sift through the book and you find out what you're going to read, I think that you'll find that that educators, um, there's a strong message that goes with it that educators can relate to. And that's something that the, the class can definitely um, relate to and, and learn from as well. Hmm. And so my whole hope is to, it's all of, all the whole bloody works, this whole six book series is really about the environment. Hmm. It's about our earth, our yeah. spiritual connection to the earth. And so um, that's what I want them to know, is that in order to live here on these lands, we need to respect this earth the way that the Anishinaabe do, mm -hmm. with, as, with as much integrity and as with much um, time and effort. Maybe not the same way, but to respect it as with, with much force as we do. Mm -hmm. there, we have no choice. We all have to live like that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, um, you know, over the course of your life, do you think you've seen, you know, more people of settler descent understand that, you know, start to know how crucial the land is and, and how uh, respected it needs to be and how respectful we need to be and so on? Oh, yeah, there's a growing movement of, of non-Native people that really, really respect the land and, you know, that are doing everything in their power to try and make, make change and to, to, you know, advance the social conscience and to more of an, you know, an ecological um, benefit. You know, so you see it. There's people out there that are, we're working very hard. There's movements that are non-Native movements all about the environment. Hmm. And so it's way more than when I was a kid. You yeah. can see it now. You know, like people are are uh, working hard out there. Hmm. And, and getting back to uh, to educators, you know, just in general, if there's a teacher who who wants to, you know, educate themselves more about Indigenous culture, stories, history, and so on, and and then they want to share that knowledge with their with their students. 
um, but they don't know where to start or, or they may feel apprehensive or awkward about, you know, approaching this knowledge and, you know, this this way of, of living. Um, how do you what, what would your advice be to to those educators who are just starting on that that awareness journey? What do you think they should do? I think they should call Wob Rice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's such a loaded question because obviously as an Ishnabek, you know, we teach our own culture, you know. We're the ones that teach our culture. You know, teachers should never teach in Indigenous culture if they're not Indigenous, you know. And so I'm a strong believer in that. But at the same time, learning about it is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, I think that, you know, we're in a, we're in a really different, we're in a weird time, you yeah. know, and I don't have all the answers, <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> you know, I, I don't know. All I know is that if people don't, if people don't smarten up and, and, you know, roll, get on with the program, done, done. Yeah. You know, gone, yeah. gone. <laughs> so yeah. I think that we have to like, you know, we have to be sensitive, but at the same time, we have to be very mindful that the laws of these lands here apply to everybody. Yeah. By default. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, and so it's it's like everybody kind of, whether we like it or not, we have to follow the, the laws of these lands. Mm-hmm. And that's something that is in the book steady over and over and over again, you know? Mm-hmm. And so... And how does that look like for, for non-native people? You know, of course they have to give to the land. Of course they have to make offerings. Of course they do. Mm-hmm. How, else, how else are they going to live here in harmony if they don't have a relationship with the land? Yeah. And uh, giving, giving back, you know, that's so important. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I don't think that, you know, our, our culture, our way of life, is ours, hmm. you know, and and I think that these a lot of the, a lot of our ceremonies and our cultural practices were gifted to the Nishnabek people to look look after, and so that's why I feel it's important for them to administer that, mm-hmm. you know, and you know it, it's the same. I would I would if I went somewhere somewhere else, say I went to India or something, I'd respect their culture, their traditions. And I would, I would also recognize that they're the teachers and the authority of those cultures and traditions. You know what I mean? I wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, I, would, I would know where my lane was. Mm-hmm. And I would learn, and I would learn from them how to live there on those lands. Yeah. Uh, respectfully, because that would be the right thing to do. Yeah. Well, it's just part, part of the golden rule, right? <laughs> As they say. Yeah. <laughs> It's part of the golden rule. <laughs> so I, I, only, I only have a couple more questions for Isaac myself. I'll just remind you, uh, viewers, that uh, Jody put up a link in the chat uh, to submit your questions. And then uh, once those are in, they'll come to me and I'll pass them on to Isaac. Uh, so just to, just to piggyback off that last question, Isaac, um, to take the pressure off people like you and me, um, let's put the pressure on the educators now, on the teachers. What, what okay. role do you think? What role do you think they play in in really informing you know generations of Canadians about the truth about how things should be and essentially bringing people together? Well, I think educators have like Canadian educators have such a beautiful opportunity in front of them. They have such an amazing, incredible, you know, door wide open situation happening where they get to to help foster and educate young minds on creating another normal, another reality for us. Um, the world is screaming for that. And so teachers have, have this incredible responsibility, the sacred responsibility to really help change the everything. Because these young people that are growing up, they know something's wrong. You speak to any young people today out there, they're saying the world's going to end and we're all going to die, hmm. right? And so teachers have the responsibility to inspire and to create change, generational change that actually means something and not just give Band-Aid solutions, but
but it's the educators that can actually change the the social conscience, you know, and and really make big differences through that. Mm-hmm. And and so I think that teachers, you know, are the best, and that they spend a lot of time and hard work being a teacher. But I also believe that the globalization of Western education is wiping out Indigenous knowledges all over the world. So I think non-Indigenous teachers um, need to make sure that space is given to Indigenous people for their own disciplines of education. Mm -hmm. That Western education shouldn't take over everything because that's how how we lost our language. Or that's that's how we got lost as a people was through Western education and through residential schools and, you know, just colonialism in general. So the education system plays a huge role in the loss of languages. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, that, you know, the frameworks and, you know, the policy policy prescriptions of school boards, which our kids go to need to reflect that we can't be in school all the time. Mm -hmm. That when it's time to go hunting, we're hunting. Yeah. When it's time for ceremony, we're in ceremony. When it's time for maple syrup or wild rice harvesting or, or just whatever, that that's the way it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that there's some kids out there, like uh, maybe you got a little medicine man running around out there, 10 years old. You know, that kid should never see the inside of a classroom. They mm-hmm. should be out in the bush learning their trade. Mm-hmm. You know, so the, the system has to conform to what we, who we are as a people, not the other way around. And I want educators to know that because educators are amazing and they can make things happen. And that has to be the new normal. Mm -hmm. There's no question. We have to have our space to do what we have to do to preserve our culture and our traditions. Hmm. Yeah. It can't be just all Western education. They say, oh, well, it should be half and half. You know, if that's what they say, then then it needs to be half and half. Yeah. I mean, that's not a bad thing. Because the Anishinaabe education, remember, those are the, that's the education that's going to teach everybody how to live without a garbage can. <laughs> so in time of a eco, in time of a ecological collapse and climate crisis, Indigenous education will be extremely valuable in the future. Mm-hmm. You know, having elders that speak the language, that know the land like the back of their hand, you know, knowing the stars is going to be critical information for food security in the future. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think that, uh, the, you know, the institutions of Western education need to to settle their kettle a little bit and just give space to the indigenous people to do what they have to do. Yeah. Fully agreed. Yeah. There needs, there needs to be some flexibility, some sensitivity, uh, just really a, a paradigm shift essentially. Right. Uh, away yeah. way from that rigid learning, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But, just, but hats, but hats off to the teachers because yeah. the teacher is doing a lot of work. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't understand how they're able to do all that work and still, yeah. and not fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> True. Well, just, just last question for me before I go to the the submitted ones. You know, what's it like for you, Isaac, when you visit a classroom and and you see some of that really beautiful work happening, and and you see you know young people inspired and and really wanting to be themselves and share knowledge and so on. You know, um, c- considering everything that we've been through as Indigenous people, how does it make you feel to see you know some positive change and some progress and so on? It feels really good because sometimes. Um, when I talk about my own experience, um, it can get pretty heavy. And I wasn't able to have those conversations five years ago, hmm. you know, because uh, anything Indian was not really acceptable. But now you can talk about it. But my favorite thing is when I'm like, I mean, to be honest with you, I don't really like talking to adults at all. I, <laughs> up, I, I uh, my joy is sitting with kids telling stories, you know. And that's such a beautiful thing when a kid zeroed in on you and they're just like, they're glued on you. They, they, they can recite the whole story back to you. And at that moment, 
they're just like completely just just absorbed into your story and you know and all of a sudden years later you get a message from one of them on facebook or or freaking twitter <laughs> saying hey i just wanted to say hi i still remember that story and it's like wow that's really nice you know it's really neat so I, it's really rewarding for me to tell stories to kids it's right really rewarding it, it it's like medicine for my heart right on yeah. Well, that's, that, that's, that's beautiful. You know, to me, I've, I've seen you share, I know the work you do and, you know, just, uh, as a dad to little kids myself, knowing that they're, they're growing up in a world where you're sharing the knowledge and, and empowering other young people and teachers to, to really, uh, engage young Nishinaabe kids to, to be themselves is really awesome. So, so that's it for my questions. And I'm going to go over to the, the questions that are coming from the chat. So, uh, I'll just read them to you, Isaac, uh, no, I'll go down sure. the list here. So the first one is from the York Region District School Board. And the question is, what might be the best way for a teacher to approach teaching about Indigenous cultural text forms when the teacher themselves is not Indigenous and knowing that many Indigenous texts are intended only for Indigenous audiences? I don't know. That's a Jody Williams question. <laughs> um, well, I think you kind of answered that too. Like you, you said, by, by writing your books, uh, of course, they're about Anishinaabe stories and your hope is that Anishinaabe kids and communities will read them, but by putting them out there, they're for everybody, right? Yeah, I mean, um, I didn't really under, the, the question was a, too complicated for me. I'm very simple, me, very simple. <laughs> Um, I, but if I understand it right, how can a non-native teacher teach the, the book or the lessons in their classroom, right? Yeah. So I think that, you know, when we, because the, a lot of the stories are, are about giving or about consequence or about sharing. And so I think just teaching those values to the kids is really important. I mean, you know, we need more of that. We need we need people to just not learn about it, but to live it, to breathe it, to be it. And so more emphasis on that by teachers is good. And they can get those values from the book. Mm -hmm. So those beliefs and values can come from those books because yeah. they're all in the stories. Mm -hmm. You know, but I, it's, yeah. Well, go ahead. Finish your thought, please. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> what I was going to say, too, is that, like, um, speaking only for myself, uh, you know, w w with the knowledge that I was raised with and that I try to share, like, you know, sometimes I make mistakes in, in conveying some of that. Sometimes I maybe miss some details about some of those stories. And then then I'll hear about it from, you know, an elder and then, you know, I'll be able to, to fully form that, you know, in, in my head so that the next time I tell it, you know, I got some of the details lined up properly. And I think that's part of the process, right, is, is making mistakes and being vulnerable and acknowledging your own position. You know, like I would never consider myself an elder or a knowledge keeper because I'm not at that point in my life yet. So what I what I say to teachers sometimes is like always place yourself in relation to the to the material, to the stories in that, you know, you're not Nishinaabe maybe, um, but, you know, you're you have the, the great opportunity to share this knowledge with your students and, and you'll do your best to relay that in a good way. Right. And, and that's sort of what I try to relay to people when I hear questions like this, too. So. Uh, yeah, it's there's, think about it, I, I think that's the first step is thinking about it, right? Absolutely. I mean, I think that there's a, there's a fear out there that, you know, maybe they'll say something wrong. Maybe they'll, they'll, they'll offend somebody or maybe that, you know, there's a real fear. There's like a touch and go, like almost like tippy toeing around anything indigenous these days, because um, is, it, is it sensitive? Like, look what's yeah. going on you know, with residential schools and, you know, the, the, the graveyards and stuff. So, I mean, people are hypersensitive right now. Mm -hmm. And, but I always say that if things are done with a good heart and a good mind, and if they're not, if they're not teaching culture, um, then, you know, you can't go wrong. Mm -hmm. And if you make a mistake, 
then that's a that's really a beautiful opportunity to learn and to to uh to do something different you know yeah. and so yeah don't be scared to make mistakes you know because that's that's how we all learn is by making mistakes by by just not having it straight you know mm-hmm. and but the important thing is is that as indigenous people you know we come from these lands our stories need to be heard our culture needs to be more you know like when you go into society in the cities and towns and all that there's no culture of ours you know there is an erasure that took place mm-hmm. and so i think a lot of times it's it's not doing anything it's just stepping back and allowing the indigenous people to flourish hmm. and to present who they are yeah you know so but the, that's a really good question mhm Right on. So here's the next question. This is from AFNEA. Do you think the shift from oral learning to written learning changes our ways? No, because we're still doing oral. We're also doing oral history too. Mm-hmm. Oral, we're telling our stories. And so it's not going to change our ways because we're still, um, like I tell way more stories than I do write them, you know? Yeah. Um, I believe in the, the, you see, when we tell our, our stories, Atsukan, that means like spirits. And when you feed those spirits in your story, they're going to keep working and working and working. And so it'll, that'll never, that'll never go away as long as we keep feasting our stories. Mm-hmm. And so our oral traditions and our ceremonies and our stories in that setting will always continue to live on. Mm-hmm. And so, it, you know, writing books ain't going to change that. No, I agree. And and everything like the foundation of anything that's written, as you said, comes from visiting with people, uh, spending time with them, um, being out in the bush or whatever else. You know, I always say like, yeah, writing is really only like five to 10 percent of what I do, you know, in terms of like the communication that I do. Right. And and yeah, yeah exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So here's a question from the Toronto District School Board. I have a similar upbringing, but in a communist country. Education was a liberating route for us. The life on the farm was beautiful, but hard. Do you find that your life in the bush was hard or great? Oh, it was great. And and hard is great too, and to me, because I kept you physically active so you could live to be 100. You don't live to be a hundred for no reason, you know. You you had to work, <laughs> and and uh, eat healthy, and you know, and uh, so for me, I I think when it's too easy, mind you, I, I I don't think that everybody has it easy, but um, but when you when life is too easy, then it's, there's probably something wrong, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like it just. You know, there's probably something wrong. Yeah, the setup is wrong if life is too easy. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's that's a really good point too, because like my my great great grandfather, uh, Peter Pomajuan, uh, is what he came to be known as from Shawanaga. Uh, some estimate that he was like 110 maybe when he died, and he had a full wow. head of black, full head of black hair when he died too. You know, so but yeah, it's full, amazing. Full his whole life, right? You know, so wow. Yeah. So yeah, inspirational. That that bush living is uh yeah, is 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 a beautiful thing too. So here here's yeah. a question here's a question from Algonquin territory. If you were able to sit with three elders or storytellers, who would they be and why? Um dead or alive. Uh they don't say, but I, I'd say I'd say dead too. Just, just uh, for historical uh, reasons. I would sit with my great, great, great grandfather, Chief Shingwak, hmm. who was apparently a beautiful storyteller. Yeah. Just because that would be so cool. Mm-hmm. I would also sit with Nanabuju's grandmother because I think she was pretty cool too, and I think she'd have a lot of interesting stories to tell. <laughs> And the third storyteller 
Oh, there's too many. I can't say. <laughs> there's there's lots. Like there is so many amazing, brilliant storytellers. Um, I would say one that always fascinated me probably was Miss David, this really old, old man who just, he told stories and, and he captivated you with his stories. But he died a long time ago and I didn't have enough time with him. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would say too, like for me, Shingwalk for sure. Uh my wife's uh she has roots in in uh in Kitagon Zibi as well in Garden River. So, you know, that that sort of trickles into my um my circle as well. So I I, I would love to hear from him. One person too in my own life, uh, my great grandma Rosie. Uh, when I was a little kid, uh, she was still around, but she she could only speak Nishnabe. And you know, I remember being a little kid and not being able to connect connect with her. Right, being able to pick up a little bit here and there. But if I ever had a chance to 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 do things over or to have her with me again, I, I'd love that opportunity just to be able to to talk to her because that's like the last person in my life I think I had that language barrier with uh, with our own language you know and that's that's a pretty heavy thing too at the same time but uh I'm sure she had tons of stories but I was never able to hear them right so um right yeah but so th those are two people for me anyways uh so here's another question from the Peel uh, district school board uh what strategies do you feel are most successful in recapturing education on the land I think that that's a really good question. And I think that one of the, uh, the main things is that, you know, there's so many different um, things to learn on the land. But the very first strategy is to learn how to, to give to the land and to have a relationship with the land. So when I used to take kids out in the bush, you know, I'd say, let's go sit with the trees for a little bit here first before we get started. Let's let's introduce ourselves, you know? And uh, that's what how it was when I was a kid, too. I'd be sat at a tree for a long time, mm -hmm. you know? I'd sit there, and now it's like I know that tree. It's like an old friend. So getting to know, the introducing yourself to the land, getting to know the land is is probably the very first strategy it's a relationship that you're gonna want to have that's what you're doing is relationship building with the land mm -hmm. and so for me that's a very first strategy that that i would do is to to build a good strong relationship with the land you know so that it, it knows you you know the land mm -hmm. and that you can form a, a, a strong connection mm -hmm. and then that way you'll know what to do and what not to do that's how I see it anyway. No, right on. I totally agree. It's uh, it, it may sound simple, but like it goes a long way, especially for a lot of us who, who live in cities now. Right. You know, it's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just being able to, to, to touch the tree or to sit on a rock or be by the water is, is massive. So we just got uh, two more questions left. Uh, this one is from the Waterloo region uh, school board. <laughs> In my school, we've implemented grade 11 English class to be the Indigenous Perspectives course. Our teaching staff is 99.9% .9 white settler European. My question is, and we sort of touched on this, but if you want to add to this, uh, feel free to. Uh, the question is, what questions should educators be asking themselves, their peers, and administrators to better their practice? I don't know. Um, the reason why I don't know is because I think that, you know, when we're talking about Indigenous people and our ways of being and our, our, our struggles, you know, with colonial institutions, it's like, I don't think that that's where we're going to find the answers. I think that that teachers and all those people should be talking to the indigenous people instead of the administrators. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's, they're going to find more clarity there. Yeah. You know, 
because if you just go to the higher ups all the time, then, you know, the chances are it's, you're not going to find, I don't think what you're looking at, the answers that you're looking for, you know, and also too, I think that, that more indigenous people, you know, it's almost like indigenous education is big money, you know, it's big money. There's a lot of money. But a lot of that money goes to non-Indigenous people. Yeah. Well, our people are still in poverty. Mm-hmm. You know? So start bringing in the, the Indians so that they can so that they can uh, share and be a part of what's going on. Yeah. You know? I don't know. That's just how I think anyway. Yeah, I agree with you too. <clears throat> you know, and... Um... It's a really hard question to answer, and and I, I get it a lot too when I'm like doing a book talk or something like that. It's, you know, someone from the audience will say, you know, what do I need to do to be a good ally, or what do I need to do to educate myself or or my peers? And it, it, it's a good way to start, right? It's a good way to think. But the thing is, like, you know, I don't know you. You know, I don't know your background. I don't know who your neighbors are. You know, I don't know like where you grew up or whatever else. So. You know, I, I feel kind of uncomfortable sometimes giving somebody a blanket answer about that. So I, I agree with what you say, you know, like maybe turn that question back to to the big bosses, to the people with the money. Right. And and say, well, start bringing in the knowledge keepers, spend that money, you know, get that sort of tangible face to face relationship happening in, in the classroom and so on. So so is, is that sort of what what you what you're getting at a little bit there, Isaac, too? Yeah, I just, I just don't, ha- I just can't articulate it as well as you can. But yes, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, um, well, you know, it's and and, and I, I have difficulty articulating that too. It's just because like it, <laughs> it's a big thing, right? Like it's pretty huge. You it's know? a big thing, man. It's a big yeah. thing. Um, but I will say this though, that you know, when I when I go to schools and I work with educational people, you know, all I see all the time is amazingness. I see people working, you know, as hard as they can to try and make things better, to try to understand the truth, to try to educate about justice and liberty. And I see teachers really always going above and beyond and listening. And like, it's really cool. Like, I think that educators now are, are, are really, really making a difference by listening. Mm -hmm. And you see this all the time where, you, you know, you go into a classroom or something or say if I'm talking to like 50 principals or a bunch of superintendents or whatever, like you see them sitting there listening, writing stuff down, paying attention, you know, being polite and courteous, raising their hand, like trying to learn. And so I like I see such goodness yeah. happening, you know, where it wasn't like that before. So you see really good things happening now, which I'm really, really happy about, you know. Um, I see changes happening. And so I want to commend all the people that are that work hard and are trying hard, you know. Because when we're talking about issues like land back and the Indian Act and, you know, stolen lands and residential schools and the graveyards and like, you know, these are big, big issues. Yeah. And that that are going to change the country Mm -hmm. and so we have to remember that our populations are like it's doubling all the time Mm -hmm. and that that indigenous people are simply not going going to go away (laughs) you know and that that they they want some of their land back and how does that look like and at some point the teachers have to educate this to to canadian society that Things are changing, and Indigenous people are going to have a larger role on how the on on how the map looks, on how education looks, on you know all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and you see teachers open and willing for that, which is amazing. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah, and and even just like this kind of thing that we're doing tonight probably wouldn't have happened five years ago. You know, uh, and no. So year in and year out, you know, educators are doing uh, spectacular things. And, you know, it just makes me hopeful for the future, for sure. You know. Absolutely. I feel more confident now than I ever did. Yeah, me too. Definitely. 
So that's it for for my questions. Chmiguetcha, Isaac. I think Jody is going to come back on and uh, we'll we'll sort of uh, she'll bring it home for us. Uh, but yeah, Chmiguetcha, everybody for your questions and Isaac. You know, you're just awesome, man. Thanks a lot for sharing all the time. You know, it's just so wonderful to have you out there. So I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Jody. Thanks, Bob. So I want to actually, just before we wrap things up, I just wanted to actually turn it over here to Roberta because Roberta was, has been teaching this, the NBE course, which is the um, Indigenous Voices course, which um, is in lieu of the grade 11 ENG course. Um, and a lot of the questions that came up um, have been things that you've encountered as well as a teacher. And I just wanted to, to have to give you an opportunity to share a little bit about how you did this so well in your classroom. Well, thanks, Jody. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I did it so well, but I think for, in my experience, students led the course. And that's something that I'm still encouraging teachers to do now as, you know, in this position is that Indigenous students really led the course. It was what they wanted to read, what they thought was um, important. Um, actually, a really good story. We had a youth panel speak when we first opened up this course many, many years ago. We brought a youth panel to speak to teachers and very similar questions that are being asked here in the chat were asked that day. And this amazing young person said to all of these teachers, it's really easy. Do the work. Talk to the people. That was her answer. And it was like, oh, right. Like, do the work. Talk to the people. And the books really speak for themselves. That's what I've encouraged people that we don't need to teach the culture. We don't need to like, you know, as Isaac said, learn about it, but not teach it because the book, it's all there in the books. It's so beautiful. It's, it speaks right there for itself, for themselves. So um, student led and student driven and community based and community driven. What is it the community is looking for? What books and novels do they want? And then do the work and talk to the people. Students have lots to say about the things that are in those books. Um, just recently, there was a class that had Wob speak into it. And a young student said to Wob in the talk, oh my gosh, the language is in the book. Like I saw myself, my language is in the book. Like how amazing to see that in my English class that I'm reading my language in a book in English class. So like no teacher needed to be there for that conversation, right? It's like step out of the way and let the kid, right? Focus on how awesome it is to see themselves in the texts. And, and that will speak for itself. I think we just overthink that sometimes. Yes. And the other thing we also give it, um, you know, remind teachers is that assume you have Indigenous students in your class. You may think you don't have Indigenous students, but often that's not the case. And so make the assumption that you do have Indigenous students in your class um, and lean on your Indigenous education leads. Every school board has a lead or department and, you know, that's they're there to help support um, with uh, resources, whether it's text or whether it's people, um, you know, they're there for you. And um, and I guess the other thing is I'm going to um, pull up the slide deck that I had because I want to reference um, a new area through FNMIEO um, that we've been building through these webinar series as well. Um, and these are just some more resources in this area. This is also where we're uh, posting the recordings to these uh, webinars as well. So give me one second to pull that up. Just so I'll add on while Jody's doing that is that in, in my experience too, many teachers will say that we don't have Indigenous students in this class or there's not very Indigenous students in this school. And then when you center Wob's book and Isaac's book and Isaac's videos and centering Indigenous, awesome Indigenous like storytellers and authors and texts and, and that is the grounding and the foundation of NBE, not essays and grammar and right when we focus NBE on and it's the course is called understanding contemporary indigenous voices like that's the name of the course so <laughs> it's pretty explanatory <laughs> right so when you're doing that um then students will and like I said in my experience they'll come forward and say 
you know, I never felt safe to talk about this before, but when I'm seeing that language is in this course and like all the culture that I know about is through these books and we're having speakers like Wab Rice and Isaac Murdoch and right. It just, yeah. Just looking at the simple title of the, of the actual course tells us. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be just in the NBE course. Like these are things what like we want, we want to normalize this throughout we want to see this happening in all courses um, because there's so much relevance. And if for those of you who were here when we did our first webinar, you know, that that question, um, why does Indigenous literature matter? And so eloquently, um, I believe it was, yeah, it was Daniel Heath Justice and said, because we matter. And so it's it's time, you know, we've had 150 plus years of real harmful colonial education, it's time to change things. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the generation that's coming up, like the teens, you know, the preteens and the teens get ready because they're, they're already ready for the change. Um, so we as adults have to, you know, hurry up and, uh, scurry, scurry and, and getting on, um, getting on board with this. But anyway, I'm going to share the screen here. Isaac, did you have something that you want to say? Yeah, I just wanted to say too that um, that our own form of writing systems also need to come back as well. And that's a part of the, the lived experience that the land has, is our own writing systems. And so it's really important that, that yes, there's lots of books and things being written down, but we also have to educate our kids our, in our own writing systems mm. our mustn't be a none, you know that needs to come back we need to make space for that because that's the original writing system of, of these lands mm. so we need to make sure that we, we leave space for that and not all of it is just this type of writing but we also have to have our own writing that's that's the main writing here that's the that's the important writing that as Anishinaabek we need to learn but it's also the writing of this land, the original writing. And so we can't smother our Anishinaabe writing. We have to make space. We have to make space. That's all I wanted to say. So just to point out, um, I put the link in the chat box here. So this is taken from the NBE curriculum, you know, and it, and it specifically talks about um, cultural text forms, which is what we've been talking about tonight. And in it, there's, um, there's a, uh, it even has like this chart, you know, and so again, I want to reiterate what Isaac was saying earlier, we want to learn about it. But we're not necessarily when it comes to cultural, um, cultural or spiritual knowledge, as for non-Indigenous peoples, it's it would be inappropriate to teach it. That has to come from the people. That's why we bring in people um, to speak to those pieces. But certainly, um, we're here to, to learn through those pieces. So that's, um, you know, I just wanted to make mention that that's right there in the curriculum, those directions that have been uh, provided for educators. Um, and oh, just before I get there, um, just to mention, so on our website, in the members only section, there's a section called NBE slash ENG supports. And this is where you will find we have um, put together something called pedagogical considerations for teaching Indigenous literatures. So there's a whole bunch of information there, recommended educator guides. Um, and like I said, we're, we're updating this section on our website. Um, so more information will be on here as well as the previous recordings. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for, the giveaway. Okay, um, I have to share a different screen for this. So thank you for all who entered into the, um, entered in to win. Just give me a second, I have to pull that screen up. Where is it here? We call it the wheel of names. <laughs> okay, let me pull this up here. So the first one, 
you want to write this down? Sure. Maybe we'll, so we don't yep. forget. Yep. Um, so we will, uh, we'll send out these books. We'll mail it out to you. So the lucky winners, we will contact you and uh, get your address and such. Um, which one, what book should we, what should we draw first? Wob, pick a book. Do uh start with the uh, trail of Nana Bojo. All right. Say. The winner is <laughs> trail of Nana Bojo. Mm. Oh, Olivia <laughs> Cummings Gilbraith. Congratulations. Okay, Wob, well, what book is next? Is hey. order serpents. Serpents. The lucky winner. Jackie Arajo. Wonderful. <laughs> and lastly, we have Moon of the Crested Snow. Who is the lucky winner? When's your second book coming out? October. Okay. Harry Haynes. Yay. Congratulations. Yay. Um, shout out to Bill Morrison. I saw your name in here. I was hoping, I was hoping you were gonna win a book. <laughs> Bill, it's been a while. We haven't haven't, uh, haven't heard from you in a while. It's good to see your name. I hope it's the same Bill Morrison I'm thinking about. Yeah. Maybe it's a different Bill Morrison. And if it is. Hi, Bill Morrison. We love you too. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for um, coming tonight. And um, we have our last, our very last webinar, the last of the four series. Um, and it's just with Wob talking about creative writing in the in the English classroom. Um, so please, um, you know, we'll send it, um, a reminder out through the Eventbrite. And um, I'm just going to pass it back to Isaac and Wob for you two, um, you two to have last words here. Well, I definitely want to thank Wob for, you know, being so generous with this time to, to be a part of this. It's a great honor. Uh, I really look up to Wob as a, as a, just a really intelligent, smart, incredible individual that makes people think and move things. So Wob, it's just been a real big honor. You know, I also want to thank Jody and friend for coming on. I know how busy you are, Jody, and, and I know how life is. So thank you for taking the time always to advance, you know, um, the issues and, and the things that matter most. So thank you so much. I also want to thank all of the teachers that came on because really, you know, when you continue to build up your students, when you continue to build up, you know, the idea of a better world, then the world does become better. And so I want to thank all of you for taking on that challenge because I know that's why you got into education to begin with. And so I just want to thank everybody that, that was a part of this. Um, you know, it's sacred work. You know, and so thank you so so much for for being here. It was an honor for me, and uh, you know, many blessings to all of you. May you all find good health and happiness in your life. And until we see each other again, bama piguabnanim, naho miigwech miwe. Oh miigwech! I will echo a lot of the same sentiments Isaac just shared. You know, Isaac, I look up to you a lot too. You know, you are leading the way for so many of us inspiring so many of us to ensure we live in a good way, not just as Nishnabek or Indigenous people, but everybody who shares this land. And, and you know, you really inspire me to to get my little guys out in the bush and, uh, you know, remember those things that I was fortunate to, to grow up with at the same time, you know. So chamiigwech to you, Isaac. Uh, chamiigwech, Jody, and the whole FNMI EAO. Miigwech to Roberta for uh, sharing tonight. And, yeah, I just want to say to all you teachers, you know, taking time out of your evening, you know, you could – be with your families. I'm sure you have important stuff to do around your homes, but you spent an hour and a half with us all learning uh, from such an excellent resource as Isaac, you know, and, and you're doing it out of the goodness of your heart. 
and for the benefit of your students and for generations to come. It's really cool that you took uh, your time this evening to, to be with us. So, so to and uh, yeah, have a good night and have a good uh, rest of your fall as we head into winter. Bama P. Bama P. And if you need your, if you need to get a book, contact Keganon's Press and they will be happy to get you books. Yeah. Oh, Miigwech. We will send out a follow-up email with those links in how to order books. Perfect. Thank you.